so one of the things that I'm going to start with, that I'm not starting for real, real right this minute, but I'm going to start a little bit, is there's a couple of communist era jokes. And if you, if you go to, or, you know, if you just look around, you can find there are joke books from various sort of communist countries, especially Germany, because you had to cope with living in a really cruddy system somehow. You know, a lot of the time it was through sort of discharging your dis distaste at what was going on through humor. So the, there were all sorts of little kind of witticisms that were associated with the with the life in, in the communist bloc. Uh, it was often said among workers in Germany and probably elsewhere, we pretend to work, they pretend to pay us. Um, and also there were more sort of more developed jokes. There's, there's one about two guys standing at a bus stop and one says, um, have you heard the new, uh, the latest joke about the Communist Party? And the other guy says, be careful, I'm a, I'm a member of the Volkspolizei, I'm a, I'm a policeman. And the guy says, that's all right, I'll, I'll tell it really slowly. People sort of found ways to express their things that everybody knew, which, which was that the government was, was uh, in addition to being bad, it was just grossly inefficient. And the police were just kind of dumb on the top, top of everything else. But there's sort of more developed ones. There's one that I was reading the other day, and it's about Wilhelm Pieck, who was one of the leaders of the, of the early uh, Socialist Unity Party. We're going to talk tonight a lot about the Socialist Unity Party, which is the, the Communist Party of East Germany. Wilhelm Pieck and um, Walter Ulbricht, who was the sort of leader in the, in the 50s and, and early 60s, and then Erich Honecker, who was the leader after that. And the joke goes, what's the difference between Pieck, Ulbricht, and Honecker? And the, the answer is, well, their sense of moderation, because Peek wanted socialism for all of Germany, and uh, Ulbricht managed socialism only in Berlin, and Honecker managed it only in Wandlitz. Wandlitz was the sort of, was the neighborhood where all the DDR higher-ups lived. So they can be a little topical, if you will, but there's some, there's a couple here that I'll share with you that I think are kind of funny. Anyway, so I'm going to get started. My name is John Foster. I'm a librarian here at the Adult Information Services Department at Mentor Public Library. I have a degree in modern European history specializing in Germany from the University of Washington, a doctorate. I also have some other degrees which are less relevant to what we're talking about here. I wanted to do a series of lectures on the Cold War because I just find the topic very interesting. It was, it was what I studied mostly in graduate school. I spent a lot of time studying the history of East Germany, which was coming into focus at that time. This was about 10 years ago now uh, because a lot of the archives were coming, becoming more available. One of the things about, or one of the interesting things about East Germany was that you know, you can, you can attribute to the, the sort of German national character generally or, or however you want, but uh, they were fanatic record keepers, especially because they were spying on, on their own population so extensively. But a lot of that stuff was, was, not, was not made available to the public order researchers, uh, especially the Stasi files, the files that the secret police kept on people, um, because they were inflammatory, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how and why that was the case. But I will say that my wife, who also did a degree on this a similar topic, focusing a lot on East Germany, uh, did research in the Stasi archive, which is out in Dalwitz Hofgarten, out in the very, very eastern part of, of Berlin, so far out that the S-Bahn doesn't even go out there. You have to take a, a train and then a bus, and then you got to walk through some kind of like uh, overgrown neighborhoods. But anyway, to, to study there, you have to sign about a 10-page long non-disclosure form because, and you have to agree that you're not going to use anybody's real name or, or use people's, identify people in a way such that they could be identified who they actually are. And, and we'll talk a little bit about why that might be the case going forward. Just as a sort of before getting going for real, uh, I just wanted to give those of you who are here a kind of preview. Next year's lecture series, I'm going to do the war in Vietnam. I've been, I've been warned frequently not to do this, um, and I've, I've, I've so far not wanted to do it for the reason that it's, it's still a wound that's pretty raw for a lot of people, and with very good reason. There's still, you know, I give these talks and I meet Vietnam vets all the time, and I don't, you know, it's, it's something I want to be very careful addressing because it is a complex topic and but it's one for which the suffering is still very close and very real for a lot of people. So, but I'm going to give a series of lectures uh, on that next year, starting in April. Uh, and I'm going to start with the French colonization of Vietnam, 
the establishment of the French colonial state in Vietnam and then move on to the uh, American war in Vietnam and then finally uh, the uh, American departure from Vietnam in the early 1970s. I'm also going to give some, I'm going to try, um, next, in the coming year, because we're probably going to be in this remote type life for a while, I'm going to try and give some more public lectures if I can. Uh, I have a sort of ethnically based interest in Irish history, so I'm going to do some, I'm going to do some lectures on Irish history, starting with on the 28th of January, I'm going to do a lecture on the Bloody Sunday events in uh, January of 1972 in the city of Derry in Northern Ireland when 13 people were shot dead by the British Army and we'll talk about how that happened, why it happened, how it affected Irish history, how it affected British history. So without any further ado, I'm going to start for real. In the mid to late 1980s in East Germany, a joke circulated. And it was a joke that you had to be a little bit careful telling, for, uh, not entirely surprisingly, because East Germany was a communist dictatorship, but also because East Germany, uh, the East German state, was probably one of the most invasive uh, of the communist states, and certainly the most invasive in Europe. Uh, it's estimated that at the height of the uh, Stasi surveillance state, the, the a surveillance state run by the Department of Staatssicherheit, or the, the Stasi, that something on the order of 5% of the population were being used as informers against the rest. That's 1 in 20. Anyway, there was this joke, and it went like this. God calls George Bush, Mikhail Gorbachev, and Eric Honecker, the leader of, the, of uh, East Germany, to sit before him and God says, well, in seven days the world's going to end and I need you to go tell everybody that this is the case. So Reagan, or Bush goes back to the United States. This is Reagan. Reagan is really the, the, the subject of this joke. Reagan goes back to the United States. Bush only became president in, in 1989, as I'm sure you all remember. But anyway, so Reagan goes back to the United States, calls a joint session of, of Congress and says, my fellow Americans, I have two pieces of good news for you. God loves you all. And in seven days, he's going to call you all home. And uh, Gorbachev returns to Moscow, and he calls a meeting of the Supreme Soviet. And he says, comrades, I have one piece of good news and one piece of bad news. Or I have two pieces of bad news. Excuse me, I have two pieces of bad news. I, I should really script this. I've told this joke so many times that I mess it up. I have two pieces of bad news. The two pieces of bad news are, one, God actually exists. And in seven days, the world's going to end. And um, Eric Honecker goes back to East Berlin and he calls a meeting of the Central Committee of the Socialist Unity Party and he says, comrades, I have two pieces of good news. One is that God has extended diplomatic recognition to East Germany. And the second is that in seven days, perestroika is going to be destroyed. Now, this is a joke that tells you a lot about the thinking of the East German leadership. Eric Honecker, this is a kind of a funny thing if you ever see pictures of Eric Honecker. He had really come up as the leader of the, of the kind of youth organizations in East Germany. And, and the East German leadership was nothing if not like a bunch of crotchety old guys. And they were very set in their ways and very committed to the Stalinist form of Marxism-Leninism uh, as it had been practiced up until uh, Stalin's death in the early 1950s. As a matter of fact, when Khrushchev came in, after Stalin's death, and especially uh, when he gave this so-called secret speech at the 20th Party Congress uh, in 1956, a lot of the party leadership in East Germany uh, just refused to believe that, that that had actually happened. They were very committed to the sort of old school Stalinist view of uh, we're going to have original, rigidly controlled security state, uh, we're going to be in uh, unceasing conflict with the West. And so when Gorbachev had come in and started in the, in the early 1980s and started talking about uh, liberalization of the system, started talking about perhaps having some market reforms and some political forms in the reforms in the, social, in the Soviet system, uh, that was not met with a great deal of enthusiasm. Uh, around East Berlin, especially in Wandlitz. As I mentioned earlier, Wandlitz was the sort of the place where uh, all the 
leading political figures in the upper echelons of the East German government had their residences. And there's an interesting thing about Wandlitz, I'll just tell you, I, I recommend, you can sort of tour the area if you ever go to Germany, if you ever go to Berlin. They had these very nice houses, they all had swimming pools, and they all had, you know, very nice, but, you know, very, very, especially very nice accommodations when you recognize the fact that the average worker's apartment in East Germany measured about 50 square meters. Wandlitz was a terrible place to live, and this, it tells you something, the reason is, uh, that they were all constantly surveilling each other, right? That they were all really true believers. This is an interesting thing, you know, sometimes people talk about communism as if it was this sort of cynical, you know, people just sort of uh, oppressing the people and, and, and feathering their nests. And there was some of that, but a lot of the people running the system in East Germany and a lot of the people, you know, and not just at the top levels, were really true believers. And you can say, well, they were deluded, and in a lot of respects they were. I mean, the East German system was a pretty terrible system. Uh, I, I think I'm not divulging any great, you know, historical novelties when I tell you that it doesn't take much digging to figure out that it was a horrible, horrible system. But there were a lot of people who really believed in it and who thought, and even ones who were fairly realistic and who thought, you know, there are some problems with this system, but they can be fixed in the long run and better this than, than capitalist exploitation of the worker, etc. Most of us here grew up during the era of the Cold War, so, you know, uh, this, the rhetoric will not, be, will not be unfamiliar. The fact that it was not a very nice place to live was evident to people from a very sort of early point the, in the 1950s. So East Germany was the only one of the Eastern European states that up until the early mid-80s hadn't had a significant uh, dissident movement. There was a spontaneous popular uprising in Berlin and several of the other cities in 1953 due to uh, increases, in the, increases in prices and increases in the work requirements. Uh, for people. Uh, this was put down uh, quite brutally by the East German authorities. And there was a sort of, this is, I, I, whenever this comes up, I, I'm reminded of this uh, poem that, the, that the, the poet Bertolt Brecht, who in fact was, was pretty committed to the East German system, but after the, the rising had been put down, there was a, there was a big article in the, uh, the Neues Deutschland, New Germany, the, the party newspaper that said, well, the people, the, the party, the, the people have disappointed the party and will have to work hard to regain the party's trust. And Brecht wrote this little poem, which he did not, you know, out of, out of I think, good sense, publish at the time in which he said, you know, it's been said that the, the, the party, that the people have disappointed the party and will have to work hard to regain the party's trust. Would it not be simpler if the, if the people were just dissolved and a new one was elected? And that kind of gives you a sort of sense of the, of the kind of backwardness of the, you know, the, the whole premise to the extent that it had one of the, of the workers and peasant state was that it was a state that was meant to look after the interest of the workers and the, uh, where the government was meant to look after the interest of the workers. And it seemed very much, and I think it's not unfair to say, but the workers were meant to be looking after the, the, the good of the government, which is, a, which is a backward system. Looked at any way you look at it, in the 1950s, East Germany uh, experienced a pretty significant population drain and a pretty significant brain drain, particularly. In that time, the borders were not really closed. The Iron Curtain uh, hadn't come down quite as, as firmly as it had in some other places. It was not until 1952 that the, that the inner German border was closed. And part of this has to do with the, the way that East Germany came to be. East Germany was, came around sort of accidentally. In fact, uh, Stalin would have preferred and said very clearly that he preferred that Germany would be reunited and made into a unitary neutral state. I mean, Stalin's sort of number one goal in the post-war period was not quite so much world domination, although in the long run he thought that that was what was going to happen. But he thought sort of more pragmatically that what he did not want was a repeat of the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. What he wanted was, uh, or 1940, excuse me, what he wanted was a series of buffer states 
uh, so that he would have some sort of space that the Soviet, the heartland of the Soviet Union, especially the, the western part of the Ukraine, which is really the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, uh, would, would be protected against possible incursions by the West. Not, I mean, it's, <laughs> I think we all know now that the, the prospect of incursions from the West was quite limited. And this, in fact, was, was uh, to a great extent why uh, the political settlement in Europe in the wake of the Second World War was what it was. I mean, essentially, Poland got shifted West by about 150 miles, and this was sort of negotiated in secret by, it was kind of agreed to by Roosevelt and then made a kind of fait accompli for everybody else. Um, and at a certain point, you know, somebody was asking, I, I think Churchill, this was the source of this comment, but it might have been somebody else in the British government, well, what are we going to do about Poland? And, and Churchill said, he even said this or he wrote it in his diary, since we're really not going to invade. So the question is, you know, what is it that we're willing to to spend to get Poland back to some status quo ante, and the, and the answer was not much. And then there's that famous sort of moment at the at the Potsdam conference when uh, someone Churchill or someone is like pointing out the, the problems of Catholics and under communism in Poland, and, and and perhaps the Pope is unhappy about it, and Stalin in a kind of bemused way says, "The Pope, how many divisions has he?" And it was very clear, I mean, Stalin was very clear about what he thought the situation was. And you could always, you know, as I've said before in some of these lectures, you could be pretty, pretty clear um, about, Churchill knew something about Stalin, which was this. I mean, Roosevelt never really understood Stalin, but Churchill did. And Churchill knew that he was a liar and a brute. Um, but he also knew that once you figured out what he wanted, you could predict what he was going to do. So you just had to make your, you know, your expectations and your plans conform to what you, what you could reasonably guess that he wanted. Because once you knew that, he, he would follow that policy with, this, with the sort of regularity of a stone dropping. The, the formation of East Germany was kind of a mistake undertaken by the East German communists, of which, you know, Stalin was not very happy when it happened in 1948. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I mean, it's so hard to get good henchmen these days. Um, but uh, he was he was very upset with the with the German communists because this is sort of like a little statelet with the three more richer and more developed parts of Germany built up into this liberal capitalist capitalist West German state against which the East German state was always going to be measured was a pretty terrible outcome as far as he was concerned and also. There was a sort of built-in tendency for people to want to vote with their feet because unlike uh, Czechoslovakia or Hungary or uh, any of the other sort of major Eastern European countries, for Germans, if you wanted to live somewhere else, there was another state, West Germany, the Federal Republic, where there were lots of Germans. Whereas if you were a Pole and you wanted to get out of Poland, where were you going to go unless you spoke some other language, English or French or what have you, your options were a little bit limited. Uh, likewise, interestingly, I think, about the, uh, the West German state, the Communist Party was outlawed in West Germany in the 1950s, and, but it was never very strong, and part of the reason was that if you wanted to live under communism in Germany, you could just go to the Friedrichstrasse station in central Berlin and you could be living under communism as soon as this afternoon, if you wanted to. Whereas in France, there was a very strong uh, communist party and, and one that just absolutely defended Stalin in a way that was truly revolting uh, in the 1950s when it was clear that Stalin had been guilty of mass murder uh, and of killing off most of the early communists on top of the whole, you know, to top it off. So East Germany had a, had a pretty significant brain drain problem. But between 1948 and 1958, it lost something like 20% of its population, very heavily weighted to people with engineering and other technical degrees. Because if you had an engineering degree, why hang around in East Germany? Unless you were really a convinced communist, which some people were, but why hang around in East Germany when you could go to the Federal Republic 
And when I say go to the Federal Republic, I mean just walk to the Federal Republic, and then you could get a much better job and also have political freedom. So there was increasing alarm in the East German state that something had to be done. And so, you know, probably at a certain point, it was estimated that the manpower loss in East Germany totaled something like between seven and nine billion dollars. And at one point, actually also, uh, Walter Ulbricht uh, tried to claim that West Germany owed the East German state 17 billion dollars due to the like sort of educational costs of all the people who had ended up fleeing to the West, which uh, his chances of collecting were uh, relatively limited. On the 15th of June, 1961, the chairman of the GDR State Council and the head of the Socialist Unity Party, the Socialist Unity Party, I will just say, um, it, was, it was called this instead of the Communist Party because in 1946 and 47, when, this, when the Red Army was in control of the Eastern part of Germany, they kind of, uh, and in, especially after 1948, when the East German state was founded, they forcibly melded the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party. And so they called it the Socialist Uni Unity Party, which is kind of a joke, not a very funny one. In any case, uh, Walter Ulbricht, who had been the, uh, for, for uh, a decade the chairman of the of the socialist the head of the socialist first secretary of the socialist unity party stated at an international press conference no one has the goal of building a wall niemand hat die absicht eine mauer zu errichten which is kind of a funny thing to say because and i say you know not in the in the in the in the in the sage words of gomer pyle usmc not funny haha -ha, but funny strange because literally almost two months to the day later, they started building a wall that went across the city of Berlin. Uh, you can see here, this is a very famous image. There was a young border guard named Konrad Schumann who had been sent to uh, the corner of the uh, Ruppiner Strasse and the Bernauer Strasse. And uh, he could see, you could see the, the, at, the, at this point, this is on, this is on the, the 15th of, of of August. The wire, the wall at this point is just sort of concertina wire. And he was standing there and there were a crowd of Germans, of, of, of West Germans standing on this other side going, come over, come over, come on, come on over. And he sort of took in that moment, the, uh, there was a cop car, the cop said, come on. And he decided that this was the time you can see he's dropped his rifle because he's not going to need that. And he just jumps straight over the wire and, and books it. And you got to respect that, you know, really, you gotta, you got to seize your chance. He uh, eventually moved to Bavaria. He married. He uh, had a job working, I think, in a BMW motor plant for a long time. But he also had some, some real emotional problems. And part of the reason was that many of his former friends and family would just never speak to him again because they felt that he had abandoned them and abandoned the uh, state. And this was you know, a, a, a problem if you were going to make what they used to call a republic flucht, that is to say, a, a flight from the republic, they, of course, the, you know, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, the, the German Democratic Republic was the official name of East Germany, and they thought they were sort of the republic. If you went, your family was likely to suffer adverse consequences. Uh, any of you who've ever seen the, the movie Goodbye Lenin, uh, starring Danny Perrault, uh, a really excellent movie from about 15 years ago now, I think. The story of that movie is the story of his family being torn apart because his father has made a republic flucht, and his mother was supposed to bring him and the children later, and she could never work up the courage to do it. But she also got, you know, pretty significantly interrogated by the, the Stasi uh, because the fact that her husband had made the republic flucht meant that she was then under suspicion. So this wall gets built basically right across the city. It's, in the beginning, it's made of sort of wire fencing and concrete block wall. Between 1962 and 1965, uh, the wire fencing was improved. Uh, between 65 and 75, they brought in a lot of concrete wall. I think I have a picture of it here. Uh, that's a better sort of 
picture of the Berlin area, but let's just look at this. So it was structured thusly. This is the sort of, um, you can see the west with the concrete wall with the rounded top. Uh, then this area in the middle with high uh, intensity lights, layers of barbed wire, mines in a number of places. Also, they, uh, they, they cover the ground with sand and gravel so you could see people's footprints in case people tried to get across that way. Uh, they had uh, watching posts at, at periodic intervals. After 1975, they started to bring up, that was when they really brought in the, the Grenzmauer uh, 75, the, the border wall 75. And the interesting thing too is that they referred to this, I think this is really funny, sorry if I'm laughing in the middle, as the, um, the Antifascistische Schutzwall, the anti-fascist defense wall, perpetrating this utterly implausible fiction that the reason that the wall had been built was not because large numbers of people wanted to get out of East Germany and go to West Germany, but in fact, because the fascists wanted to come into East Germany. And one of the sort of funnier moments in, um, so the, the premise of Goodbye Lenin, for those of you who haven't seen it, and I, I very much recommend that you do, is that the kid, it's about this, this kid who's living in, in East Germany in 1989, and his mother, has become, after this thing with her husband leaving, a sort of minor party official and a very committed, apparently committed communist. And she has a stroke and she goes into a coma and when she wakes up from the coma, the wall has come down. But he and his sister, the boy and his sister, are afraid that if she finds out that communism has collapsed, it'll be such a shock to her system that she'll die. So they try and recreate East Germany sort of in her apartment with, with sort of very funny and, and sometimes very poignant consequences. But one of the things, she wants to watch TV and they have to create these fake news broadcasts. And one of the things they see is people like flooding from one side of the wall to the other. And he tells her, no, that's not people leaving the GDR. It's capitalism that has collapsed. And all the capitalists are trying to get into the awesome East German state, which is, you know, for those of us sitting here, it's like obviously absurd, but of course she very much wants to believe it. Uh, here's a picture of the wall. You can see the that's the eastern side that we're looking toward too, and you can always tell because the western side is the is the one with the rounded top um, facing outward toward it. Uh, if you ever go to Germany, there's a really great the Checkpoint Charlie Museum has a really great exhibit on the various ways that people tried to get around the wall over the wall. One guy snuck himself out in a steamer trunk in which, you know, which couldn't have measured more than about three feet by two feet. The fact that he managed to get himself into it is a real uh, uh, tribute to his desire not to live under communism anymore. This is the Potsdamer Platz in the 1920s. Potsdamer Platz was uh, one of the real centerpieces of Europe generally and, and certainly the kind of showplace of Berlin uh, back in those days, you can see the clock, the famous world clock down at the bottom. There's a guitar, guitar, the uh, department store with the sort of uh, rotunda, sort of in the, the top middle. This is the Potsdamer Platz during the East German period. Uh, you can see they ran the, the death stripe or the Todesstreife right through the middle of it. You can see actually the circular tomb from the department store. This picture was taken, I think, in 1972. And the significant amounts of East Berlin had not been, I mean, that part was so close to the death stripe that they didn't, that they didn't rebuild. But there was still like, you know, up until 10 years ago, you could see parts of, uh, of, East, German, of East Berlin that hadn't been rebuilt after the Second World War. In 1989, 1989 was one of the most interesting years in of, of the entire 20th century, I think it's fair to say. And in that time, uh, significant challenges were happening to the communist order. It was a time of increasing demonstrations uh, and increasing popular discontent in Eastern Europe, not quite so much in the Soviet Union, but part of the thing driving the process was Gorbachev's moves toward liberalizing what was the system in the Soviet Union. And part of it was uh, this perestroika idea in which uh, Gorbachev realized that the Soviet Union 
was lagging very considerably behind the United States and the Western liberal capitalist states, uh, both in terms of general industrial production, but also in terms of technological development. Ronald Reagan is often sort of credited with uh, undertaking policies uh, that caused the downfall of the Soviet Union. There's a sense in which that's correct. Ronald Reagan's uh, fiscal policy amounted to a sort of Keynesianism as if it was being run by Darth Vader. That is to say, sort of the normal Keynesian idea is if the economy is slow, uh, the state spends countercyclically to try and increase demand, which then increases production uh, and, and, and the, the economy is sort of, it's like a, this sort of theory is kind of like an artesian well. Um, and irrespective of whether you think that that's a, a, a plausible economic theory or not, what the Reagan theory was, to a great extent, was, uh, I mean, Reagan expended, or expanded government spending pretty dramatically, particularly in the defense budget. And his expansion of the defense budget put the Soviet Union under particular strain. Also, this was a period the Soviet Union spent a lot of this period fighting a brutal and ultimately failed uh, conflict in Afghanistan, one that was to an extent supported by the CIA, which had, uh, which was through its offices in uh, Pakistan and also through its contacts with various uh, Mujahideen forces in Afghanistan, basically arming anti-Soviet fighters on the premise that the enemy of our enemy is our friend. Uh, I think if any of you read Steve Call's Ghost Wars, you will uh, discover, I think, a pretty good argument to suggest that the situation was, at the very least, more complicated than that and had some fairly unfortunate consequences. But that's a matter for another day, certainly. But there was also, in addition to perestroika, there was also glasnost, which, which in Russian means, roughly speaking, new openness. And the idea was that there were people were going to talk seriously about what was actually going on. I mean, a lot of what went on, uh, for the, any of you who've read uh, Midnight in Chernobyl will know that uh, there was a lot of fantasy that went on in Soviet industrial production, uh, such that uh, people running you know, heavy industry knew that if you got uh, materials produced in the Soviet Union, chances are you were going to have to fix them before you used them, which was bad enough if you're running a normal factory but truly unfortunate when you're running a nuclear plant. One of the problems that, that underlay the, the disaster in Chernobyl in 1986 was that they knew that there was a fault in the design of the RBMK reactor, um, which was the sort of the main type that was being used in the Soviet Union, but that information was suppressed and not shared with people running RBMK reactors uh, with the consequence that a series of unfortunate decisions made by power station crew trying to run uh, a test uh, turned into a catastrophe that possibly could have depopulated Europe if, if the other situation, if, if it had been allowed to, uh, if it had not been uh, effectively controlled eventually. And even at the beginning, the officials uh, on site told Gorbachev things which were not true about what was happening and about the degree of control they were able to exert over the situation. And this really, you know, Gorbachev uh, was not a dumb guy. And he, uh, I think, started to see the value of having actual information flowing around uh, at least the halls of government, as opposed to things that people wish to be the case. Uh, across Eastern Europe in this period, there are increasing calls for liberalization, especially in Hungary. Uh, Hungary had been, interestingly, one of the more, and I'm speaking relatively here, uh, liberal states since the 1950s, ironically, because this relative uh, liberalization happened in the wake of the deposing and execution of Imre Nagy after the uh, Hungarian uprising of 1956. In uh, March of 1989, a uh, coalition of liberal political parties started staging demonstrations. One on the 15th of March, 1959, drew something like 100,000 people in Budapest demanding uh, liberalization 
economic liberalization and the extension of capacity to run for office to people outside the Communist, the Communist Party. Uh, later in the year, there was a similarly large demonstration in Prague on the 28th of October. Czechoslovakia was a much more repressive state, state especially after the crushing of the Pre Prague Spring in 1968. So the fact that political uh, calls for political liberalization were going on in public there was a sign that things were, were, uh, were coming to a, a difficult pass for the communist system. Uh, meanwhile, in China, and I can remember in the, in the spring and summer of, of 1989, many of you probably can too, the protests that began uh, on the 4th of May uh, in Tiananmen Square, starting with about 400 students. Eventually, they built a gigantic sort of paper mache Liberty, Statue of Liberty. Uh, it eventually drew several thousand people demanding freedom uh, demanding a uh, liberalization of the, of the Chinese communist system. Finally, on the 4th of June, the government troops cracked down, killing an unknown number of people. The low estimate is about 500. Uh, higher estimates have gone as high as 2,000 and sometimes more. A lot of, once, you know, once again, what was driving this was Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was born in 1931. Uh, in the very southwest part of, uh, of Russia. Uh, he joined the Communist Party in 1950. Well, at university, you can see there's a picture here of, of that's Gorbachev with his grandparents. He was of mixed Russian and Ukrainian ancestry. Gorbachev is a really interesting guy. He's still around. He uh, came up working in the, the Komsomol, which is the Soviet youth, the not quite the Boy Scouts, but the kind of youth organization in the Soviet Union, or the the, uh, organ the, the, the element of the government that's, that uh, undertakes youth affairs and getting youth motivated for communism, etc. He was a very convinced communist. He managed to, you know, so 1950, he's in the Communist Party during the later stages of the Stalin period. When Khrushchev comes around, he adjusts very easily to that system. He gets a reputation as a kind of a reformer, but a kind of stolid party guy. Uh, he becomes the head of the Stavropol region in 1970. In this time, he's occasionally taking vacations with Yuri Andropov, the head of the KGB, which is not a bad friend to have on the whole. And there's a perception in this period, okay, so I'm going to share with you another piece of Soviet humor, another piece of communist humor, and it goes like this. It was a joke that went around. Um, it's, it started in the, in the late 70s, I think, and it goes kind of like this. Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev, uh, Brezhnev are all on a train, and the train stops moving. So uh, Stalin says, well, pretty clearly the, the train crew are counter-revolutionaries, so we need to have them purged and get a new crew in here. So they, they purge the crew, and the, the train starts moving again. And then it stops again, and then Khrushchev says, well, the problem is that we need to sort of like get back to the roots of socialism, so let's take all the track that's behind us and put it out as track in front of us. And so they, they shift the track around, and then the, the train starts moving again, and then it stops again, and Brezhnev says, I know what we'll do. And he just goes around the train car, pulling the shades down on all the windows, and finally when they're all pulled down, he goes back and says, okay, the train's moving again. Um, and that's a kind of a, a, a sort of recognition that the Soviet uh, economic growth and the Soviet system had really hit a wall by the 1970s and early 1980s. The Soviet economic uh, output had grown pretty dramatically in the 1950s, but a lot of that was because the, the, the growth was incremental and starting from a very small, a very low level to begin with because of the destruction that had been wrought by the Second World War. But they really could never quite get over the hump. I mean, once again, when you have this series of, of, of plans in which it becomes sort of okay for people running the system uh, to just lie randomly about, uh, about how much is being produced and under what conditions and of what quality, that's unfortunate from the perspective of consistent upward economic expansion and growth. Two, uh, I mean, it's, it's, there's a sort of interesting moment in the 1970s in East Germany when they decide that they're going to have a kind of consumer culture. So they want to the, the premise to begin with has been that we, you know, we're going to build up heavy industry and then 
once we do that, once we equal and surpass the West in terms of our heavy economic development, then we'll be able to, uh, you know, it's a kind of butter your bread in the center and the edges will take care of themselves uh, type of theory. Like, but they never could quite sort of get consumer culture going. And part of the reason was the a sort of difficulty in, in, I mean, and this is a problem that socialism has generally, uh, and, and, uh, and has one which has been noted for a long time. There's a very famous article by the conservative economist Ludwig von Mises that, that gets back to this issue from the, from the teens. I think it was written in 1919. The thing is that socialism doesn't allow you to read economic signals in the way that market signals do. So you don't really know what to produce because you're not getting the, the right feedback. And they could never get the, you know, you know, there was always too much of something or too little of something else. So there's another famous joke here, let me just tell you one, about a guy who goes into a cheese shop and he says, I'd like to buy a pair of shoes. And the guy working the counter says, sorry, this is a cheese shop. Here we have no cheese. The shoe shop is across the street. There they have no shoes. You know, once again, they could never get the sort of levels right. They could never really respond to consumer demand because basically the, there was a lot of sort of one-size-fits-all thinking. But once Gorbachev got uh, to be the head of the Central Committee after the death of Brezhnev and then of uh, when Andropov died, he sort of on his deathbed tried to sort of do the laying on of hands and say Gorbachev, who was his friend and who he thought was a, a, a right guy, should run things. They instead uh, made Konstantin Chernyenko the head of the head of the state, um, which was a little bit of a lifetime achievement award. But then he died, I think within a, I think three years, perhaps. But then Gorbachev took over, and Gorbachev really wanted to take a very cold-eyed look at what was going on in the Soviet Union and see what he could do to rejig the system. One thing, and I think this is really interesting. So one of the things that they, if I, I really recommend the Chernobyl miniseries that HBO did. It's it's absolutely excellent television. But it gets a few things wrong, and one of them is there's a point at which one of the people trying to sort of sort out what's happened goes to meet with, uh, I think, Brukhanov, the, the local party boss, or the guy, the local head of the, uh, I think he is the local party boss, and in the middle of the day, and he pulls out a bottle of vodka and takes a couple of shots. Uh, and that's very unrealistic for this reason. One of the things that Gorbachev thought was, well, people drink too much, which was true, and uh, so he started this this uh, sobriety campaign, such that you know you would have weddings going on in the Soviet Union, which were alcohol free, which was pretty much unheard of, and I mean pretty much unheard of anywhere. Like I don't I don't, I don't know that I've ever been to an alcohol free wedding anywhere. Um, of course, that may, may have something to do with my own inclinations, but uh, but this was at a time when they were trying to really address the problem with people consuming too much alcohol in the Soviet Union. And this is a kind of mark of uh, Gorbachev's uh, influence on society. One of the things that happens, you know, once again, the, the breakdown doesn't quite start in the center. It starts uh, in Hungary. Hungary, uh, once again, has a, has a relatively liberal type system, but it's also a place where people go uh, quite often on uh, vacation. And a lot of times uh, Germans would go to uh, vacation in Hungary. East Germans would. They were allowed to go because they were allowed to sort of move between. It was relatively easier to move between states in the Warsaw Pact uh, than was certainly to go, go to the West. You had to get permission to go to the West and that could be very difficult uh, to come by. Getting out of East Germany was not the easiest thing to do. Like it used to be that you could just go across the border. Well, once it got shut down, you could try and go across the border. The place to do it in Berlin was at the Friedrichstrasse station, which was right, it was just on the eastern side of the border. And there was a sort of a series of, at the Friedrichstrasse station, there was a big hall that had a series of small offices that you could go and try and convince whatever bureaucrat it was to let you go. And it was called the Tränenpalast, the Palace of Tears, because it was very hard to get out. Now, you could also, if you were sort of a kind of more intellectual caste, one of the ways you could try and get out was what was sometimes referred to as uh, emigration by publication. So if you wrote something in public that was critical of the government, oftentimes they would just expel you. But that was a dangerous 
gambit because a lot of things could happen between the time that you wrote it and the time that you, you know, you know, you couldn't be sure that that was what they would do. And your family could suffer fairly unfortunate consequences. I mean, this was a very standard tactic. In East Germany, I mean, this is one way that they got, uh, you know, how is it that you get 5% of the population spying on the rest? And one way is, well, you just go to people and say, look, you know, we're not asking for anything crazy. Look, just every month, just come by and tell us if you hear anything hinky, you know, if people are saying things they shouldn't or doing things they shouldn't. I mean, you're a good loyal citizen, right? But they could apply more pressure. And one way that they used to do it on women, this was actually a fairly uh, uh, often used, as I understand it, uh, ploy, would be to go to, you know, you go to a woman and say, look, Frau so-and-so, uh, we'd like you to sort of keep tabs on what's going on in and around your household. And, uh, you know, for the good of the state. And if you don't, we'll put your children up for adoption and you'll never see them again. Uh, and that's a pretty powerful piece of hardball right there to lay on somebody. And you knew that if you made the jump and you made it on your own, chances are people in your family were gonna lose their jobs or they might get sent to work in the uranium mines in Vismar, which was not a very helpful type of environment. But one thing that East Germans were allowed to do was to uh, holiday in Hungary, especially at Lake Balaton. And, uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, West Germans who could enter Hungary freely would meet their relatives. They couldn't meet them in Germany, but they would meet them in Hungary. Uh, the Hungarian government was uh, experiencing serious turbulence at this time because they were experiencing uh, fairly severe inflation, partly because of uh, Hungary's uh, massive foreign debt. And Hungary started uh, engaging in negotiations with the Austrians about liberalizing the border crossings 20 years before that might have caused a problem but the Soviet Union and and Gorbachev made it clear that they weren't going to stop I mean that they were not uh, going to use the Red Army to stop that and in fact they were inclined to remove the Red Army from Hungary which they eventually did so there's a very bizarre moment, and I'm going to show you some pictures from it, where the, the Hungarian government announced that they were going to have what they call the pan-European picnic. And the theory pretty clearly was that people were going to be able to go to this location on the border with Austria and just go across. And about, I think the number is ultimately 100,000 people showed up. And you can see them just booking it. And it's, I get a little emotional looking at these pictures because this is really moving, you know. These people, you know, look at this mother in the top left one with her little boy and how much joy must she be feeling? Uh, and the, the kid is, you know, clearly a little worried about what's going on, but the mother knows, like, now my kid is going to be able to grow up without having to worry about saying the wrong thing in front of the Stasi or, you know, having to toe the line to this cruddy system. And I think that, you know, it's really moving these people just sort of saying like, you know, the system is terrible and we're going to express the way it's terrible by just leaving. <laughs> this is uh, uh, what the site looks like today, by the way. Here are other people stoked to be leaving the border crossing. Some more uh, images from you can see this one on the right of the wire fencing between Austria and Hungary getting cut. East Germany came under increasing pressure at this time. This is people storming the Stasi headquarters, which several years previously, you know, they would just never have considered, considered doing. One of the things that was going on was uh, a series of events called the Monday Demonstrations, which happened in Leipzig. Leipzig is the second largest city in East Germany. And it happened because uh, the churches occupied, especially the Evangelical Lutheran Church, occupied uh, a peculiar place in East German society. Now, this is a, one of the sort of closer approximations of an actual totalitarian society that existed in the 20th century, but the Evangelical Lutheran Church was placed 
in society in such a way that the government was not exactly legally prevented from entering churches, but had to be very, was very circumspect about it. And so uh, a series of kind of uh, prayer meetings got going at the Nikolai Kirche, especially in, in Leipzig, which came to be called the Friedensgebet, which means the, uh, the peace prayer. And uh, as these things started to get bigger, they started to have these weekly demonstrations led by the, the local prelate, Christian Führer, in which they were basically just demanding peace. I mean, what they wanted was, this is a time when the anti-nuclear movement is really getting going, and people are kind of really realizing, you know, one of the things that was really motivating Ronald Reagan's willingness to negotiate with Gorbachev was Reagan's fear that a nuclear holocaust was going to happen. And he really, if you read Robert Service's book, The End of the Cold War, what you, what you see is a picture of uh, Reagan being very concerned that that, that, was going to, that that was going to happen. And at the same time, the Soviet leadership, although they sort of in public talked about the possibility of winning a thermonuclear exchange, you know, those of you who recall the, the early Matthew Broderick uh, movie War Games, where they sort of nearly get to DEFCON 1, and then the computer that's been sort of running the thing says, you know, global thermonuclear war, what a strange game. The only way to win is not to play. And there was a realization even at the higher levels of the, of the Soviet military establishment that there was just no way to win, right? And at the same time, there's a realization going on at street level. And this goes on, this has been going on in West Germany since... Uh, the late 1950s with what are called the, uh, the Ostermarsch and the Easter marches, which were anti-nuclear marches, with the formation of the Green Party, which a, a, good, a goodly portion of the early people in which are members of the anti-nuclear and, and eco ecology movements. But the, you know, there's, this, there's this kind of ecumenical call for peace going on. Interestingly, this is a little bit of a sidelight, but, I, but it's something that I find kind of interesting. Uh, another thing that was going on in East Germany was the development of a, of a kind of a punk rock scene. This has been detailed in a really excellent book by a guy named Tim Moore called Burning Down the House, H-A-U-S, H-A-U-S, House, the German spelling of house. And the, the punk rockers, a lot of times, were, were, were allowed to set up concerts and stuff on the grounds of these churches because the, the, the church people, although they, you know, they thought the, the punk rockers were a little bit obnoxious, also recognized that they too disliked the system and were willing to sort of put their bodies on the line. And I, you know, I grew up in and around the, the, the punk rock scene in the 1980s, and we had a lot of problems, but you know, they did not include getting beat up by the Stasi uh, or you know, trying to figure out which one of your friends had dimed you out to them. Uh, which is a problem that, that the kids in East Germany had. So there's a kind of really interesting synergy that goes on between the churches and the underground music scene that has a very powerful effect in promoting and, and, sort, of, and sort of synergizing this kind of public opinion around the idea that what needs to happen is a liberalization of society. In early 1989, Eric Honecker, who had been running the country since the 1960s, uh, stepped down in favor of uh, Egan Krenz. Uh, and Krenz decided that he wanted to sort of make some moves toward liberalization. And so he uh, offered a kind of a, a more liberalized travel policy. And this is part of what led to the sort of people going into Hungary uh, to try and find a way out of the, of the system. Also what happened was, so in late October, or in the beginning of October, uh, the demonstrations in Leipzig start to get larger and larger, and the state starts looking to crack down. As a matter of fact, there's a point, and I think this is on the, uh, before the big, dem the big de demonstration in Leipzig is on October 9th, and the night before, the local, the Stasi, the Stasi higher-ups say to the locals, okay, like, we've got to really clamp down on this, and they call the hospitals, telling them to expect, like, a large number of casualties in the near future. The local Stasi uh, ultimately uh, thinks better of, of a course of action that would have led them to fire on 
tens of thousands of unarmed people. And this is really one of those kind of really moving kind of people power moments at which it was so clear what people wanted. And people were willing to, to, to put their bodies on the line. I mean, this is a thing. Like, uh, if you were going to go out and demonstrate publicly in East Germany, you ran a really good chance of suffering some very adverse physical consequences from doing so. I, I have a friend who's from East Germany who told me one time about he, him and his friends getting chased through the Mitte section of Berlin by Stasi agents with, uh, who were holding, like, carrying pieces of rebar. And uh, so if you were gonna, if you were gonna get out there in public, there was, there was every likelihood that, that there was gonna be the unfortunate physical consequences. But the, the Stasi finally, I think, decides to hold off. Things finally come to a head on the night of November 9th. Things in, following the large demonstrations in Leipzig, extensive demonstrations start in Berlin, in East Berlin. Uh, and especially uh, at the bridge uh, at the Bornholmer Strasse. Uh, you can see here, there's the bridge right there. Um, this is the bridge. The color photo is the kind of down facing side of the bridge. And um, this is, you can see it's in the sort of red box here. There were a number, you can see that from this map, uh, there were a number of places where certain people could cross and others couldn't. So at, at Zonenallee, down in, down in uh, Neukölln, uh, and in Ober, Oberbaumbrücke, citizens from West Berlin could cross to the east, but not vice, I mean, the West Berliners could go back, but East Germans couldn't go across. At Checkpoint, Dra uh, Checkpoint Bravo, under, at Trevitz, down in the southwestern corner, and at uh, Griebnitz and Vanze, you could get on the, the, the highway that would take you to to the Federal Republic. You could leave, uh, once again, via rail from Spandau uh, on the far western uh, side. But, you could, but once again, this is only people with bearing uh, passports from the Federal Republic. And you can see kind of in the middle here, Checkpoint Charlie, that's the only place where uh, foreigners, so if one of us had wanted to go, that's where we would have had to cross over, uh, and diplomats uh, could cross there. You can see the, the Bornholmer Straße and the Brzeborka that was a, uh, the site, by the way, of a kind of, of, a, of a ghost train station. The, 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 Easter, the West German uh, U-Bahn went through it, but it didn't stop there because it had been taken over by the East Germans. Uh, but there's a massive demonstration uh, that gets going around 9. Um, by, tens, by 10.30, there's tens of thousands of people sort of swarming the area. And uh, the commander of the East German border guards there, whose name was Harald, Harald Jaeger, finally allows the guards to open the checkpoint, figuring, you know, this is a thing that's happening right now. And there's this, you know, tremendous flood. This is the, you know, once again, the Bornholmerstrasse up in the corner here, of people crossing in both ways. People from the West kind of curious to see what the East has been like. People from the East really curious to see what the West has been like. And I mean, just imagine, you know, if there had been a wall that went right through public square and that you hadn't been able to go over to, to the western part of town for 30 years. Like, think about how weird that would be. It's, once again, I, I find these pictures really moving for, the, for the, you know, the reason that there are all these people who've, you know, the, the East German system was a horrible system, not only because it destroyed people's lives, because it tamped down their life chances, but also because if you were East, living in East Germany, you could see a better life that you could actually go to. I mean, it's not like, you know, a Czech thinking to yourself, well, I'd like to go to the West, but where am I going to go? You know, what am I going to do? If you're in East Germany, you could just, I mean, West Germany is tantalizingly close, right? And it's, and it's obviously a better system. Now, well, we'll get this close to it. So this is a, a, the, the sort of final picture of that moment that I want to show. This is West German citizens on top of the wall. This is, I think, the Brandenburg Gate is kind of beyond here. And it's, it's this kind of moment of, of sort of coming together. I think it's really, there's a sort of really beautiful, really beautiful aspect to this. Now, um, 
1989 was certainly not done. There had been in the Soviet Union by this time, not exactly multi-party elections, but elections where people outside the Communist Party could run. There were political liberalizations in Poland, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia. There were riots uh, in November, starting in a little town called Timisoara, which had had a sort of interesting history in the, in the, in the, in the pre-World War II era in Romania that resulted in the fall of the Ceausescu regime and in the execution of Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife, I think on Christmas Day, the 24th or the 25th. They were just, they were given a sort of summary trial and then put up against a wall and shot. But it was clear that the bell was tolling for the communist system, a system which had really outlived any reason for its existence. In the, you, you might have argued sort of at the beginning, well, perhaps some sort of alternative to capitalism was a reasonable uh, outcome from the Second World War. I mean, one of the things, one of the sort of defining factors of the 1920s and 1930s was that capitalism hadn't operated very well. And a lot of people thought, and I don't think completely unreasonably, that the problems were systemic and that maybe some other system might be, uh, might be a better situation. Stalinism really put paid to that idea, I mean, at least in terms of, of, of kind of Leninist communism. But what happened then, I mean, it was sort of, you know, people, I think, and, and I can remember those days, and you can probably too, you know, if you had told me in 1980, in 1980 just to, you know, that 10 years later, communism was going to go away, I would have told you you were nuts, right? Because it just seemed like it was just there, you know, it was just, uh, I can remember watching that when that movie that I think was called The Day After that was about nuclear war, uh, they showed it on, on, on U.S. Uh, national network television, and then they had like Carl Sagan and all these other people talking about it, and I really grew up thinking like, you know, how far away are the mushroom clouds, and that's, so that whole like consciousness had really shaped the post-war era. Um, there, was a, there was a feeling in Germany that a new order was a warning. When it became clear that the wall was going to be breached, uh, Willy Brandt, who had been the, uh, the chancellor of Germany in the 1960s, and who had started the first kind of tentative movements uh, toward kind of rapprochement between West Germany and East Germany in his policy, which was referred to as um, Ostbindung, or connection with the East, uh, gave an interview in which he said, now we are in a situation in which what belongs together will grow together. And this was a real statement of hope. Well, what happened? In Germany, the process was complicated. Reintegration of the uh, former East German states into the sort of reunified German states happened under West German auspices. The so-called Neue Bundesländer, the new federal states, which are uh, the former East German states, to this day have rates of unemployment that's two to three times higher than they are in the western parts of Germany. Those are also the area where the uh, sort of far-right and occasionally neo-Nazi movements have proved themselves strongest, uh, ironically enough. West Germany has struggled to overcome its, its communist past, and there's that sort of moment uh, once again, I return to uh, the movie Goodbye Lenin. Uh, there was a certain, there was a sort of cultural theme, which is often referred to in Germany as ostalgie or nostalgia, uh, in which people who had lived in the East then, you know, felt a sort of like after it was gone, uh, felt a sort of fondness for it. I mean, everybody had a job; it was a cruddy job, and you weren't really getting paid. But that's, you know, or you weren't getting paid much. You had to wait 10 years for a car and maybe longer for an apartment. But, but there was this kind of feeling that people looked after each other in a way that was jarring for former East Germans, often referred to as Ossies or Easties, when they came into contact with West Germans, Vesies, um, that there was a sort of feeling that they were kind of thrown down on their own devices. I mean, the West Germans uh, came in and kind of wound up all the East German industrial enterprises, most of which were not particularly efficient, but uh, it ended up with a lot of people who had had cruddy jobs uh, or not very fulfilling jobs or not very well-paid jobs having no jobs. And that was a sort of a situation which people were unused to. 
in other places, the situation was, I, I don't want to say smoother in, in you know, uh, in the Soviet Union, once Gorbachev had, had liberalized the system, the first thing that happens is he comes under very severe criticism from uh, the liberals, uh, the leading figure among whom was probably Boris Yeltsin, the, the mayor of Moscow, demanding even greater liberalization. And in fact, once Yeltsin gets, to, gets into power, uh, the state comes under the influence of some very convinced uh, hardline free marketeers with the consequence that uh, the Soviet, the former Soviet, the now Russian economy, uh, runs super hot and super cold and becomes very, uh, very unstable. Uh, other places had a relatively more uh, stable transition. Hungary had a relatively stable transition. Czechoslovakia eventually elects Václav Havel, the dissident playwright, as their first president. There's a sort of moment in the, in the early 90s, I, I think it was in 19, maybe 89, that Francis Fukuyama wrote The End of History and the Last Man, in which he basically said, okay, may have been 90, I guess, uh, liberal capitalism has won now, and we're at the end of history. This is just going to be what it is from now on, forever. It's turned out to be more complicated. And uh, I think if, if, if we learn anything about Europe from looking at the history of the Cold War, it's that these things never, never pass away in the kind of orderly way that you know, we might hope or expect that they would. So that um, in Germany, in Poland, uh, you know, Poland had a, had, a, had a recent conflict, I guess a couple of years ago now, in which the, you know, there's a lot of people in Poland who want to sort of like make it so you can't talk about any Polish collaboration with the Nazis, of which there was a certain amount, and that you can only really talk bad about the, the communists, which I sort of understand because Polish communism was not a very nice system either. But a lot of the, uh, of the right-wing populist movements that have gotten going uh, in Hungary, in Poland, in, Czech, in the Czech Republic, and in Slovakia, um, and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, have their roots in dissident groups that got going in the period of the Cold War and under communism. And I think that the thing that, you know, perhaps to try and end on a positive note, which I think is worth doing, is that, you know, putting together this talk has, has had some very moving moments for me because ultimately you learn something when you look at the collapse of communism about what human beings really want. These people, you know, even in these very dark times, even when they were living in a society that, that uh, severely limited their freedom, severely circumscribed their life chances, there was still this idea like, you know, I'm going to take whatever steps that I can take, you know, for freedom, for a better life. And if, you know, in some cases it didn't work out, uh, probably the collapse of, uh, of that system, well, there's no problem about it. The collapse of that system, I think, was a step forward uh, for human beings generally. The question that remains to us, I think, is can we consolidate that step forward to a sort of a world order, a European order, a human order uh, that values the, the individual freedom, that values uh, the contributions uh, that individuals make, but also values the connections between human beings uh, that, that knit society together.